Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com, and this is a comparison video to help you decide which one of these three cameras might be the right one for you. Now we have the RP, the R7, and the R10, all from Canon. Now originally, we were just gonna put the two brand new crop sensor cameras up here, but because the RP is priced the way that it's priced, basically 20 bucks more than the brand new EOS R10, we decided to put it here even though it's a full frame. Now before we go much further, I have a ton of real world usage experience with all three of these cameras. The funny thing is, the RP, I have real world usage dating all the way back to when it came out all the way years ago. We're talking almost four years ago, the RP came out and when it came out, it was a pretty cool camera. I actually liked using it. It was a small body with a full frame sensor. And at the time, three and a half to four years ago, it was pretty good for what it was offering you. But how does it hold up today? We're gonna run over all of these specs. But like I said, I've taken these bad boys into the real world, shot the Philadelphia Phillies with the R10 and the R7, as well as soccer. So there's real world experience using these. Oh, and also in Florida, when we were testing them out on skateboarders, birds, there were some volleyball players as well as alligators. But let's jump into some of these specs. Starting with the sensor, the RP has a 26.2 megapixel full frame sensor, which is similar to the one that was found in the 6D Mark II, and it has a Digic 8 processor. At the time when it came out, pretty good. Still pretty good as of today. Now on to the EOS R7. It has a 32.5 megapixel APS-C crop sensor sensor. Now it's a crop sensor, meaning it's smaller than what you find inside of a full frame body. Because the sensor is slightly smaller, there's some different things that happen to that, different high ISO noise capabilities. There's things that we're going to get into as this video goes on. But the biggest thing to think about is every lens that you put on it is going to be magnified by 1.6 times. So if you have a 50 millimeter, you multiply it by 1.6 and you get whatever is on the screen right now because I can't do math that fast and I didn't practice beforehand, but you magnify it. So that's where you lose out on the wide angle, but Canon does make some EFS glass. And by some, I mean like two lenses that they have for EFS cameras as of right now. Correction, I mean RFS glass. EFS glass was the old uh, for DSLRs with crop sensors. So everything that you put on there, you multiply by 1.6. Now in terms of the R10, you have a 24.2 megapixel APS-C sized crop sensor in this bad boy. So who gets the, the thumbs up? What is the best image quality that you're gonna get from up here? This is kind of tough because I love full frame, but the newer sensors offer you a lot of different things. So I'm gonna skip giving a check mark on this one because I'm not really sure who gets the best of the best with honors, sir. Moving on to the engines inside of these cameras, AKA the image processors. The RP has a Digic 8 image processor. Obviously it's a couple years old and the Digic 10 didn't exist as of yet. Yet, but the R7 and the R10 both have a Digic 10 processor. That is the newest processor. You find that in the more expensive R5, R6, as well as the R3, which is a $6,000 body. So right off the rip, we're giving check marks to the R7 and the R10 for the processing horsepower that you get from that Digic 10 processor. Now moving on to the native ISO range, the RP gives you 100 to 40,000 natively. The R7 gives you 100 to 32,000 natively. The R10 is the same at 100 to 32,000 as well. I, I think in terms of cleanliness, I'm, I'm a big fan of going with full frame sensors. I like full frame sensors. You can push them a little higher, but also the processor comes into play here. So a Digic 8 processor versus a Digic 10 processor, maybe it's more even in this day and age between the older full frame and the new crop sensor because of the Digic 10 processor. Now it's interesting because the RP does up to 40,000 where these two go up to 32,000. I'd probably say that the image quality is going to be very similar 
at this point. But I've never gone to 32,000 ISO or 40,000 ISO. If you need to shoot in that low of light, there's really no light that is actually there. So I don't really push much further than 12,800, but I also like to use better glass where I allow more light to come in and I'm not using the cheaper uh, kit lenses, which cut down on the amount of light that actually gets accepted by these sensors, which means you have to raise the ISO. That's a whole different story for a totally different video where I teach you about shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, but we're not gonna do that here. I think these are pretty even across the board. In my real world usage, shooting in different situations, the higher ISOs haven't been bad at all in the R10 or the R7. A lot of people will say crop sensor means you're not gonna get that great of quality. In this day and age, you can get great quality with just about anything if you know what you're doing. Now moving on to the lens mounts. Each one of these cameras have the same lens mount. It is the RF mount. It's unified across the board. That means when you take any RF lens, you can put it on any one of these bodies. But now that Canon has released some of the RFS lenses, they will still probably work on the full frame, but it's not recommended that you do that because it's going to use the center portion of the sensor. You're gonna end up with vignetting. I honestly haven't tested it out because there's no reason to put a crop sensor lens on a full frame body, at least that I know of. If you think there is one, don't yell at me. Tell me what it is down below and I'll take a look at it. But th this is an important thing to talk about, lenses. Photography is all about glass, 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 glass. If you're looking to be a photographer, you want better results than what you're getting with a cell phone, then glass is the thing to invest your money into. I always invested in good glass. F2.8s, 1.8s, 1.4s, 1.2s. They're gonna give me better quality results in multiple lighting situations. The reason I'm hammering this home is if you're getting an R10, you might be okay with just traveling with a lighter lens that's a variable aperture lens, meaning as you zoom in, the aperture changes. They're not the best pieces of glass, but if you're looking to just go shoot pictures, one of those EF, oh, sorry, I keep doing that, RFS lenses is going to be fine. It's going to be good enough. But Canon also makes some inexpensive RF glass. They have a 50 1.8. They have a 35 1.8. They now have an, they have an 85 F2. They have a bunch of more inexpensive RF glass. But my recommendation for all of these cameras here, for anybody getting into photography now and investing in these systems, is there's nothing wrong with the EF glass. Canon put out millions of EF lenses. Sigma put out EF lenses. Tamron put out EF lenses. They adapt seamlessly with the EF to RF adapter. The reason I say this is you can save so much money by, by buying yesterday's good glass. That's important. Invest in glass. I know I'm taking a little extra time here, but glass is the most important thing. And when you can save money by adapting the older lenses here, like a 70 to 200 2.8 version two, or a Sigma 70 to 200 uh, sport, you're going to be really happy with the results versus paying money for a subpar or not as fast of a lens in terms of aperture for one of the RF mounts or the one of the RF lenses. So that's my recommendation there. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you this photo taken with the R7 and edited with Fro Pack 3, starting with Winnebago. Winnebago gives it a pretty cool look. Then we've got Prestige Worldwide. Then November Rain, which kind of looks really good on this, followed by Mentos, King Contrast, Eckert, Capone, and Fifth Element. But there's one more I want to show you from Fro Pack 1 called Skittles because look at what Skittles does with one click. If you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you want to save even more and get Skittles, which is part of Fropack 1, you can get the triple play bundle of Fropack 1, 2, and 3 and save even more. Now, Let's get back to the comparison. Moving on to frame rate. The RP up here gives you five frames a second in one shot, gives you three to four frames per second in speed priority, and one to two frames per second in tracking priority. That's really, really bad. Um, 
I'm gonna show you that in just a second, but let's move on here. The R7 gives you 15 frames a second with the mechanical and 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter. And the R7 will give you the same 15 frames a second with the mechanical and 23 frames per second with the electronic shutter. Now you can shoot with the electronic shutter in the RP. You just have to go to one of the scene modes to activate that. This is silent shooting. Now you do have the option I don't recommend that you do use it often because not only are you gonna fill up that buffer really quick that we're gonna talk about uh, shortly, but you also might get some rolling shutter. That's where if you're gonna swing a bat and you're taking a picture of someone swinging a bat, the bat's gonna be bent because that's what's happening. It's rolling shutter, it's capturing things at different times and you might get that. But if you need to shoot silently, then go into that mode when you need to but for the most part, you don't need to go into that mode if you're in a loud environment. But let me let me play this for you. And by play this, I'm picking this one up. Here, here's, what are we set to? Hit the Q mode. We're in high frame rate. You ready? Oh, that's like death. That's like three to five frames a second. Then you've got the, the, the focus priority right here. Oh my, oh my God, please take it away. I'm doing that for a reason. That's what that sounds like. This is the R10 right here. What are we set to? We're in the high mode. This is, this is 15 frames a second with the mechanical shutter. That's 15 frames a second with the mechanical shutter in a really inexpensive body. I didn't have 15 frames a second basically ever with a DSLR, ever. My first DSLR did eight frames a second at a time when most people did three or four. So the fact that you get 15 frames a second with this, 15 frames per second with this with mechanical shutter absolutely blows the RP so far out of the water that I really wanna throw it off the desk right here and tell you not to get it. But there is someone who might find this useful. If you are a landscape shooter, someone who's not gonna shoot action, you're not shooting races, you're not shooting sports, but you may wanna travel and have that full frame sensor to get the full frame quality, then this could be a good option. But if you're gonna try and track something, you're gonna try and shoot sports, it's gonna be ungodly slow when you have the options of what these two bad boys offer you. So guess what? Negative check mark for you, RP, negative. Moving on to the autofocusing systems in these cameras, the RP has dual pixel AF. They claim that it has 4,779 phase detect AF points with only 143 of them selectable. It now has IAF. It was added after the fact with a firmware upgrade. It works. It's not as fast as the other two. It's a much older focusing system. Canon stopped really talking about how many focusing points. Honestly, I think all the camera companies are going to stop talking about those focusing points because we don't even manually select them anymore like we did back in the day. Like when I had nine back in the day, I selected my focusing point. Now, the cameras are so smart with the dual pixel AF and the dual pixel AF2 that they just go to where they need to go to and you don't even have to think. You just allow the camera to do what it's going to do. Moving on to the R7, and I might as well add the R10 because they have the same exact focusing system. It's the dual pixel AF version two autofocus that is inherited from the much more expensive R3. It's 651 phase detect AF points, flexible zones. There's vehicle tracking, there's bird tracking, there's human tracking. We actually utilize IAF right now to track me automatically. Like if I move this way or I move this way, I move forward, I move back. It's gonna follow me around. By the way, we're using the Canon R5 here. We've got a 28 to 70 F2 on that bad boy. We've got an R5 down here on this camera with a 70 to 200 2.8. So we're using the Canons in here to film our videos. Now I mentioned that it inherits the autofocus from the R3. It can't be the exact same as the R3 because the R3 has a stacked sensor, which has a much faster readout than these two. I'm not going to get into the details on that, but the check marks are definitely going to the R7 and the R10 because they share the same exact focusing system. They share the same focusing system with the more expensive R6 and R5 and inherits the one from the R3. That's pretty crazy that Canon has done that. It's amazing autofocus. Now onto the max shutter speed. You've got one four thousandth of a second for the mechanical and electronic of the RP. One eight thousandth of a second for the mechanical in the R7, as well as one sixteen thousandth with the electronic shutter, which is very nice to have. That's why this one is gonna get a check mark. I'm gonna tell you as soon as I finish the other, it's gonna get a check mark because it's better. 
The R10 maxes out at one four thousandth of a second with the mechanical shutter and the electronic shutter. So this R7 is more on the line of like, we're a pro crop sensor camera, and that's reflected in the more expensive price, which we'll get to at the end of this video. So check mark is going to the R7. A lot of this is given. When it's more expensive, you're like, oh, it's probably better in some cases, but the fact that it shares so many similarities to the R10 is a big bonus to the R10. Now, let's get to burst rate. The RP, if you can actually handle shooting 50 frames in a row, because that's gonna take like an hour to just sit there and listen to that, you can get 50 RAW files in a row. The R7 gives you 51 RAW files at 15 frames a second, so you got a couple of seconds of shooting before you outrun the buffer. I have not outrun the buffer with the R7 at this point. It, it's pretty good and I shoot raw the whole time. As you see, I wear it on my shirt, I shoot raw. Now when it comes to shooting with the electronic shutter, you're gonna get 42 raw files at 30 frames per second, which means about a, a, a second and a half before you obliterate that buffer and you won't be able to shoot. That's for emergency situations where you're trying to capture something. It's pretty insane that it can do that, but just know that if you're shooting the, the raw files, it's going to obliterate that buffer quickly. Speaking of obliterating buffers, the R10 can do 29 raw files at 15 frames per second, which is pretty good that you're getting 15 frames. It's just not as big of a buffer as you find in the R7. Now, when it comes to shooting with the electronic shutter, you're gonna get 21 raw files at 23 frames per second. Now that sounds confusing, but what that means is that you're getting less than a second of shooting speed. So clearly the check mark, which I already said is going to the R7 on this one. Let me jump in here real quick and say that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I've been using for my personal photo website for over 10 years. 10 years! And get yourself a 14 day free trial at squarespace.com slash photo. The reason that I use it is it's inexpensive, it's easy to use, you don't need to know coding, you just drag and drop and you're good to go. So if you decide after the 14 day free trial that Squarespace is for you, use my code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now let's move into video. The RP has a 1.74X crop 4K video recording at up to 24 frames per second. There's a ton of rolling shutter. It's like my money don't jiggle jiggle, it folds. That's right, as you go side to side, it's going to be wobbly and herky-jerky and jello-y. And at 1080 up to 60 frames per second, you will get a full width readout. The 4K in this is basically unusable. At the time, three and a half, four years ago, it still wasn't that good back then either, so. It's not the best, but if you just wanna get video, it's gonna get the job done, just not as good as something like this R7, which gives you full width 4K recording oversampled from 7K. You can get 4K up to 60 frames per second, but with some binning, and also offers a crop mode if you wanna get a little bit more reach. Now, 1080p will give you up to 120 frames per second. There is unlimited record time. C-Log3, it has vertical video info, as as well as auto leveling and IBIS. Yes, that's a lot of stuff. Auto leveling of the sensor. It will help counterbalance your movement. If you're off axis a little bit, you're gonna actually see it move the sensor for you. I turn that off. I like doing my lines by myself. And by lines, I don't mean cocaine. I don't do drugs. Don't do drugs, kids. Take a bite out of crime. McGriff, crime dog. All right, IBIS is important. That's your image stabilization. When you pair it with the newer RF lenses, you're gonna get a lot of extra stability if you're running and gunning and shooting video without a gimbal or a tripod. So IBIS is really worthwhile, and that's why you're spending a little bit more money for the R7, because it doesn't, the RP doesn't have it and the R10 doesn't have it either. Now moving on to the R10, we've got full width 4K recording oversampled from 6K. We got 4K at 60 frames per second, but with some binning as well. It also offers you a crop mode if you want to get more reach. Now you can do 1080 up to 120 frames per second with unlimited record time. Once again, there's no C-Log and it does have vertical info for shooting video. So a lot of people are doing TikTok these days or vertical video for shorts or reels. It's here to stay. Don't get upset about it. Adapt to it. These cameras do it. They put the information into the file so that when you bring it into the computer, it's coming in vertical already. The key here is the fact that we have 
unlimited record time. Up until more recently, some of the cameras did 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 29.59, and then you had to stop and start again. Now, they're giving you unlimited record time. And back to the RP real quick, if you're looking to do that cinematic style footage, you're not gonna get it with the RP. The best up here, again, of course, is the R7, but the R10 is not too shabby for what it offers. Moving on to some inputs, the RP has a headphone and mic jack input, the R7 has a headphone and mic jack input, and the R10 has just a mic jack no headphone output, so you can't monitor your shooting. I don't think it's that big of a deal, but when you're a video shooter and you wanna make sure that the audio is good, it may be a big deal for them, probably investing a little bit more money for something that does have it if you're going to be doing that. So that is not a deal breaker at this point. Next up, let's talk about the EVF, which is your electronic viewfinder. We have an entire video explaining the differences between an optical viewfinder and an electronic viewfinder. Just think of one as optical, you're seeing right through. So it's optical and the other is electronic. It's like a little TV screen put inside of this camera and I'm sure someone has hacked it to put like stranger things on it, which it's not really a hack. You just put the video on the card and you watch it back. You could kind of do that. I don't know why you would do that. Don't actually do that. You've got a 2.36 million dot EVF inside of the RP. It is a very small EVF uh, and you kind of have to look straight through it. It has a magnification of 0.70X. It's difficult to look through. If you're not looking through the direct center of it, it kind of skews a little bit. You get used to it, but it is kind of a pain in the butt when you have to look right through the middle because if you look off to the side a little bit, it's gonna be thrown off. The R7 has a 2.36 million dot EVF. Now the magnification is 1.15X. So it's a beautiful, bigger, brighter viewfinder. It's just much more enjoyable to shoot through. And the R10 over here has a 2.36 million dot EVF as well. It's very small and it has a magnification of 0.95. It's tiny. I mean, like really, really tiny to look through this. After shooting through it for a while, you kind of get used to it. But the same thing with the RP where you're looking through, if you're not looking through the middle, it's gonna give you a little bit of an issue, but EVFs are amazing. You see everything right in front of you. Obviously the R7 has a better EVF at this point. Just know that the R10 is going to have a smaller EVF. While we're talking about EVFs, let's talk about the LCD screens on the back of the cameras because we've got a three inch 1.04 million dot vary angle touch screen on the RP, a three inch 1.62 million dot vary angle touch screen on the R7, and on the R10 we have a three inch 1.04 million dot vary angle touch screen as well. You, you ever see people holding cameras out like this when they shoot? There's a reason you have an electronic viewfinder. It's to put your eye up to it. I know people are like, but Jared, this is how everybody shoots these days. This is not a stable way of shooting. And if you're holding it in front of you like this, why can't you put your eye up to it and shoot? You see how I'm putting my eye up to it, tucking my elbows in? That's how you should be, I'm saying it, that's how you should be shooting in the majority of the situations. But if you have to shoot above your head, that's why you have a very angle touch screen. You could do this. I'm okay with that because you can't put your eye up to that unless you get on a ladder. If you need to get down low, you have the option to do this. So I just want you to understand that you should be looking through the electronic viewfinder and not using the back screen as your viewfinder to touch focus or to shoot the picture. That's not stable. If you just want to look like an amateur, because yes, amateurs, you, you kind of look like an amateur when you do that versus a professional when you put your eye up to it. Who cares what other people think? I do sometimes, but uh, um, you, there's a reason we look through the viewfinder, except in cases where you can't access it and you need to use the very angle touchscreen. So very angle touchscreen is gonna be good on all of these because if you're a vlogger, you can hold it back like this, you can flip it around, you can have it off to the side if you're gonna be shooting video. So that's really good that they all have that. Let me jump in here and say, are you looking to purchase any of these cameras that I've been talking about? Well, look down below in the description because there are affiliate links that help me continue to make these types of videos. You'll notice that some of the links are from allenscamera.com. They are a mom and pop store that has supported me since day one, and they've been around for over 40 years. So if you wanna support a mom and pop store, check out allenscamera.com to purchase new, used, or anything in the camera world that you might need. 
Moving on to some of the body features you might find. There's no joystick, so you're not finding it on the RP. You do have silent shooting, but like I said earlier, it's only in silent mode. The R7 has a joystick with a spinning wheel, which is great. It has an on and off video toggle, which I have to get used to using because none of the other cameras really have that from Canon, which means when you turn it on, it's in the middle. If you turn it all the way to the left on, that's actually, that's where you flick the switch to the right, but the, it, turns on this way, that's going to video. So I just like a switch where it's either on or off and I access video a different way. That's my personal preference. Um, you'll get used to it the more you use it. It's just that I use every single camera on the market and sometimes you forget and I end up in video mode when I really want to be in photo mode. Now you do have a digital hot shoe on this for new accessories. Uh, the shutter can come down to protect the sensor when you turn it off. It's weather resistant uh, and it's a very similar body feel to what you would have with the last DSLR that they made in this range or in a crop sensor, which is the 90D. Now onto the R10, you do have a joystick. It's a teeny tiny joystick, but at least you have it. You do have a digital hot shoe, which is great. And you have a built-in flash, you know, for when you wanna flash people. Not your body, but with an actual flash. Now, for those who don't know what a digital hot shoe is, it's a newer hot shoe, which allows you more for video features to put, say, a microphone plugged right into the hot shoe where you don't have to run a wire to the mic input because it's digitally passing that information directly through the hot shoe into your camera. So there's always new accessories coming out for it, but a digital hot shoe is a little better than the old dumb hot shoe that didn't have the ability to do that. It helps you cut down on how many cables are attached to the camera. Moving on to the SD card. You've got one SD card, UHS-2, inside of the RP. The R7 has dual SD card slots. They're UHS-2. I love having dual card slots because I like to shoot redundant photos. It also lets you shoot redundant video. What that means is I put two cards in the camera, and when I take a picture, it's saving the same exact picture to both cards. Some people set it to where they shoot RAW to one and JPEG to the other, or they shoot and fill one card before they fill the second. I don't recommend that. I rather have redundancy. Cards are inexpensive, put two cards in there, have it save the same files to both cards just in case there's ever an issue. The R10 has a single SD card slot. It's a UHS-2 SD card slot as well. Now, the R7 has a door on the side, more professional for putting two cards into the camera. And with the RP and the R10, it's where the battery is underneath the camera. You flip open the door and you gotta press it up in there and that's where you get your one card. Another thing to mention about these three bodies is there's no vertical grip options that you can purchase. Now for the RP, there's a dummy grip. Well, it's a little extender on the bottom that's 80 bucks that allows your pinky a place to rest, but it doesn't allow you to go vertical. It doesn't allow you to put an extra battery in. As you get into more expensive cameras, you're going to see you can add grips. None of these cameras do that. Now let's move into the battery power. We've got an LPE 17 battery in both the RP and the R10. It's a much smaller battery and one that is twice the size and twice the power you find inside of the R7. That's an LPE6NH battery. It's the same battery that you use for the R6 as well as the R5. So it's a bigger battery, thus giving you a little bit more power, more record time, more run time, more shooting time. And of course, a bigger battery in most cases is probably better. Now, if you're gonna buy any of the, the RP or the R10, actually all cameras, make sure you have at least two batteries with you. But you do have the option to USB charge these cameras except for the fact that when you're USB charging the RP, you can't actually shoot with it, but you can shoot with the other two right here. Now moving on to weight, we've got 1.07 pounds or 485 grams on the RP, 1.35 pounds or 612 grams on the R7, and 0.94 pounds 429 grams are on the R10. It is a much smaller body, much lighter body, as you can tell. It honestly feels like a toy in the hands. The RP feels great in the hands. The R7 feels really good in the hands. And the R10, I mean, you, you pick this up and you're like, I mean, it has a nice grip on it. It feels good, but it definitely feels a lot more plasticky, but that's because it's less expensive. 
So let's talk about pricing. The RP is $999 for a full frame body. That's why it's sitting here right now. The R7 is $1499 and the R10 is $979. So that's why we put the RP here because there's a $20 difference between these two, two bad boys. And I know some people might be okay with this full frame. At the end of the day, which one of these bodies is right for you? You have to ask yourself the question, are you looking to step up as a photographer over time? Is this the profession you want to get into? Or even if it's not a profession, do you just want to be a better competent photographer than someone just taking snapshots? Not that there's anything wrong with taking snapshots if that's what you want to do. The R7 is the place you go if you want to work your way up, but you don't want to spend $2,600 plus dollars to get uh, the R6, which is full frame. I really like the R7. The fact that the speed, the autofocus speed is on par with the R5 and the R6 and similar to a $6,000 body is mind blowing. The R10 is a very nice option for people who just wanna take pictures of their kids running around or they're gonna be on stage or they wanna shoot video and they don't really care about stepping up in the future save the 500 bucks, get some better glass in my opinion if you can. This is gonna be an okay option for you guys. The RP, as I said earlier, is really for people that want that full frame. You're not gonna be shooting fast moving objects or you're not gonna be wanting to get 30 frames a second or 15 frames a second, but you want full frame, you want a small body, you want something light, this is gonna be okay. I personally would not be purchasing this. If I had to pick any one of these cameras, I, I would go with the R7 in my shoes. Just because of the build quality and the feel and the 15 frames a second, even though you get 15 frames a second in here. Look, if you only have a thousand dollar budget, it's gonna be very difficult to get into one of these cameras. If you can squeeze out a little more and you're just starting out, the R10 is a super powerful camera 15 frames a second. The first time I started shooting sports with a Canon EOS Elan 2E, it gave me three frames a second, right? Now you're getting 15. This is a, is a very competent camera for the money. My recommendation, as I said earlier, and I wanna reiterate it once again, because I wanna hammer it home, glass, 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 glass. Invest in good glass on all of these bodies. If you wanna save a little bit of money, buy the EF lenses with an adapter. You will not be disappointed. You're gonna save money, but get really good glass that's gonna to continue to adapt into the future. And when you wanna sell it in the future, it's still gonna hold a lot of its value. All right, I know that's a lot of information, but the point of this video is to help you decide which one of these might be the right one for you. Which one do you think you'll go with? Let me know down below. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, all of that good stuff. Jared, pull in photo.com. See ya.